Your Best Just Got Better, this webinar is dedicated to the first part of the book where we discuss, go into great detail around the ideas of working smarter. What does that mean to you? So in this webinar, it'll be about 15 minutes or so, just want to share with you a couple of the stories and the behind the scenes of this first part of the book. And as you know, when you dive into this, there are three chapters that really set the scene for the rest of the book. You have a whole chapter that we call Improvement in You, or Improvement in Me, right? And that's where I ask you to take a very good, very distinct, a very clear look at how you're operating up till now. Also, I introduce a couple of the concepts that I'll describe further in detail throughout the book. One of the concepts is the four limited resources. I talk about the limitations of time and energy, focus, and the ecosystem or the systems and the tools that you use on a daily basis to get your most important work done. Now, if you have any questions, always I'm available. That's my text number right there if you want a text message or my email address. And of course, the book, you could pretty much open up to any two pages and just read those 500, 600 words and you'll probably walk away with an idea of something that you can use right away. So let's get, let's get into this. The messaging that I'm getting right now, the notes that I'm reading online, the people who are reading Your Best Just Got Better, one of the common themes that I'm hearing is the fact that there's so much, there's so many different activities, people just want to know where to begin, where to start. So here's where I suggest you start. Identify what the word better means to you. And if it helps, go to the dictionary, look up the word in the dictionary, write that definition out. If it helps, go talk to a mentor or a colleague or a coworker. Maybe take a friend to coffee or to lunch or go to happy hour together. And what you want to do is you want to sit down and give yourself a good 20 or 30 word definition of the word better. In my seminars, I'm actually carving out time at the early part of the seminar right now where I'm asking people to fill in a good half a page with an example, with a dedication, with something that shows here's what better means to me. And one of the things that I encourage you to do is imagine that you're standing in front of your nephew or your niece. Maybe they're six or seven years old. And what you're attempting to do is to explain to them your philosophy of personal improvement, personal development, professional development. What does the word better mean? I grew up with that saying, right? Don't believe the grass is greener on the other side and make do with what you've got. And, well, I saw this picture and I knew I had to put it in the presentation. I mean, what's this goldfish thinking, right? The water's cleaner over there. The company's better over there. The bowl is, I don't even know. Anyway, it's really important for us to stop and step back. I mean, here's the truth, right? No one around you is surprised that you're reading a book titled Your Best Just Got Better. And that kind of presupposes, it, it infers that there's a better that you're moving toward. And I just put this picture in because it reminds me of what happens when we become aware, when we come, when, when I am, am present and when I'm going through my day and I'm fully, uh, I'm using all of my senses, right, fully engaged. So uh, this is the flight deck of a 767 uh, American Air, Airlines aircraft. And as we were flying across the country, we were just here, um, ground, we were on the ground when I took this picture, uh, of course, right? Anyway, what happened is as I was flying across the country, I realized that both the captain on the left, you can tell she's the captain because she's got the four um, uh, bars on her uh, shoulder there, and then the co-pilot were, were women. And it was the first time that I'm conscious of that I was, uh, you know, there were two women on the flight deck. Not that that's a right or a wrong or a good or a bad or a big or a little thing, but for me it was, let me see how aware I can be about what's going on around me. And I think it's that awareness that I'm going to ask you to bring to the table as you're reading through this first section of the book. And really, when you identify something, when you see something that was there all along, and then you turn and you see something that maybe you'd missed before, and I always give this example in seminars, but a long time ago, Jody and I attended a management seminar. We were looking at the concepts of paradigm shift in the workplace and how different people were looking at the, the world under different models. And the specific 
area that we were focusing on was the Gen X, Gen Y, and Gen Z, or the mobile generation, depending on what you call them. The, the idea was that different people look at the world in a different way. Now, of course, right? You know, why can't they just look at it the way I see it? But they don't. In fact, the way that some people look at the world is so different that they see things that I never saw. Right? And to really drive home the point during this class, the presenter, she said, you know, Jason, it's like the arrow in the FedEx logo. And I, I'll be honest with you, I had never seen the arrow in the FedEx logo until she showed me that the way they designed this, the, the way the logo works, the way that they use the font, that right in the middle of the E and the X, there was an arrow basically telling you what FedEx does. Now, this webinar is not about FedEx, it's not about logos, and it's not about arrows. What is it about? It's about looking out into the world and identifying the ways that we could shift, change our mental model of how things work. And any one of these locations, you can see me writing, speaking, talking about the kinds of things that we're going to be stepping into. So, let me dive in. I want to share with you in the next oh, five, five and a half, seven minutes. We'll see if I can get, uh, get you out of here. But I want to give you a few ideas about what we mean, what I mean, when I say work smart. And this has to do with being effective, being efficient, working productively. And I always give this quote, and I remember it myself, right? If improvement doesn't mean something is wrong, if the fact that you getting better is not because there was something going wrong in the past, but that's just how you're moving, then this book is for you, right? By the way, people who say, oh, Jason, I don't need to get any better, or oh, no, no, you know, only people who have this need to improve. This book is for those of us who say, well, wait a minute, getting better? That's what I'm going to do every day. And if I could share a couple of tips with you, I'll do everything I can. So a couple of things that you can expect to see in part one under Work Smarter. Um, this idea of what practice makes. And by the way, practice does not make perfect. There are some other things that practice does make. We're going to talk about the differences between managing actions and managing thoughts, managing verbs and managing nouns. And I'm going to give you some tips on how you can get the most important things done during the day. Now, although I'm going to go into detail, I spend a whole chapter in the book later on on self-efficacy, you're going to notice that if you, if you take a look at the first three chapters, the first 80 or so pages of the book, what you're going to see is I'm talking about this concept the whole time. It's what I believe is possible. It's what I think could be done. It's where I intend to go that these are the kinds of things that make for a self-efficacious viewpoint about productivity and performance. And then you can see here in all of my work, when I talk about growth, development, encouragement, building yourself, I'm always going to talk about influence. I'm always going to discuss what I surround myself by, the magazines I subscribe to, the books that I purchase, the people who I invite to dinner, the people that I call, the people that email me and I email back. All of those things are what influence my growth. And so, basically, I want to surround myself by those kinds of people and those kinds of pieces of information, those kinds of things that are going to encourage and build me up. Now, there's a couple of different kinds of work that you do. There's a couple of different kinds of work that you're focused on during the day. You're focused on nouns. These are projects, people, trips you're taking, events you're planning the things that need your attention, and then there are the verbs, the tasks, the to-dos, the actions, the things that you delegate, the things that you're waiting for, the things that other people ask you for. And essentially, one of the things that I encourage you to do is to take out a to-do list, to take out your recent plan, if that was a paper-based or a digital-based, or if it helps, Go ahead and just open up your email in-basket, because in your email in-basket, depending on how you work and the work you do, you'll be able to find in your email in-basket. Now, if you have a lot of emails, and I'm talking hundreds or even thousands of emails, the folks that I work with that have a lot of emails in their inbox, they tend to approach their work from a noun orientation. What does that mean? It means the person's name, the sender, or the subject, the subject line, the noun, 
those are the things that remind them of what they need to be doing. They need to be working on. They need to be thinking about. Uh, by the way, have you ever seen someone's name in your inbox and felt stress? That's a noun. All right, the other kind of work, and by the way, those of you who like to keep your inbox below a screen or even empty, right? There's this zero-based in-basket concept that I've heard people uh, uh, subscribe to. But those of you who like to get your inbox processed, get emails out of there as soon as you can, chances are you have some way of tracking the verbs of those emails. So you see an email and someone asks you to give them a call, so you put on your to-do list, call Barbara about the upcoming event. Someone emails you, they ask you to reply with information, you're not ready to reply with information, so you add to your to-do list, email the content to Bob regarding the upcoming program, whatever that is. So the takeaway here is to go back to your to-do list, and I talk about this in the book. Go back to your to-do list and separate out. Here are all the things that I need to think about. Here are all the nouns that I'm managing over time. And then from that, you can make your lists, you can make your inventories, you can start to organize the tasks that are going to get that done. You are what you think you do. Whatever it is you think you do, that's usually how you'll self-describe. <laughs> It's usually how you'll figure out how to introduce yourself, how to put the signature line at the end of your email. It's the kinds of books that you attract. So one of the things that you'll start to do in chapter one of the book is you'll start to take a look at shifting, changing, enhancing, evolving what you do so that you change what you think you do so you change what you are. Oh, by the way, here's a great quote. Your normal is months, maybe even years, it could be decades in the making. Whatever's normal to you, right? Normally, what time does do, do meetings start? Do you start at 9.05? Do you start at 9.10? Do you start at 0.900? Uh, you're normal. How long does it take you to commute from the office to home, from home back to the office? You're normal. Uh, how early do you give things to your team because you know that sometimes they may procrastinate a little bit? I hope you see what I'm doing here. What I'm, what I'm explaining or what I'm self-realizing one more time is that what I do on a normal, consistent, routine basis, that's my normal. That's my acceptable. And so when you take a look at changing a little bit what's your normal, what's acceptable, and what you'll let in, well, that's when we start to talk about the power of influence. And we have three different influencers that you're going to read about in the book. Homeostasis the very fact that we tend to do what we've always done. Context, we tend to work differently based on the different areas that we're in. And network, you will work differently if someone is sitting next to you versus if somebody else is sitting next to you. So those three things, heavy, heavy influencers into workflow management and productivity. The amount of improvement that you make right? The actions that you take, how much you change between where you are and where you're going. The movement of improvement, the actual motion, right? The movement of improvement requires action, attention, and review. And each one of those, very, very significant action, I've got to do something, attention. I have to be focused on it while I'm doing it. Review. I have to turn around and assess what I did to make sure that that's what I needed to be working on. You're going to read about the four limited resources in chapter one. I'm going to go through the book, and I'm going to talk at length about your time, your energy, your focus, and the ecosystem that you work in. In fact, in the book, I really focus in on the tools and the systems that you work within. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. Your productive day happens in this order. Your tools and system impact what you focus on. What you focus on impacts your energy and where you spend your energy impacts how much time you have. So if you think about it, right, if an email lands in your inbox ecosystem, if you look at that email and get stress, you might use extra time trying to recalibrate. Versus if you look at your phone because someone just text messaged you and you get that giddy, excited feeling inside and your energy goes up, pretty soon the end of the day is here. So you can actually change any one of these and the impact it'll have is on the other ones. Now, of course, I'm staying with this theme. So here I am in the uh, flight deck of another airplane and this one we landed at JFK uh, and I got a conversation in with the captain. 
And what I was talking about with him was the significance of how things were placed in, in his cockpit, in his area of influence, of where he worked. And one of the things that he shared with me was the absolute significance of where he sat when he did certain things. And flying east to west and west to east, they sometimes switch seats. So one person will fly, one person will be co-pilot, one person will fly, one person will be co-pilot. When you get back to your office, when you get back to your desk, when you sit down in your flight deck, in your cockpit, think about what you need, where you put it, and when you access it. All of those things, by the way, are going to lead straight into this focus concept. And autofocus, auto blur. So let me just share a little bit about my thinking behind this. Autofocus, uh, do you have that little lower right hand corner announcement in Microsoft Outlook? When you get a new email, there's a little transparency icon or the sound, ding. If you're in a different kind of a email environment, you may have something that shows you or tells you that you have an email, a text message or a voicemail. I know when I'm in meetings and I see people out in the audience with their Blackberries, all of a sudden that little red light will start blinking on different people's Blackberry devices. It's pulling their focus towards something. Now, let me share with you a little bit of my philosophy here behind this third bullet point, auto blur. I don't think we're 18, maybe 36 months away, but I believe that there are going to be some software technological add-ins that actually assist us in blurring out information and actually not seeing things at certain times. You know, I mean, to me, it totally makes sense. If it's 943 on a Tuesday morning and my computer system, email, Outlook, Lotus Notes, Gmail, whatever, if it's 943 and my system knows that I have a 10 o'clock meeting, if I get an email from American Airlines announcing a upcoming sale or announcing some promotion they have going on, that should not go to my inbox. Now, I don't want to make a filter because I may never see it again, right? But I need the system to blur out non-essential information and then have that come back in. So maybe I train my system, and now I'm getting a little bit future, I'm future casting here, but maybe I train my system that when I have that low energy dip, I have that between about 2 and 4 in the afternoon, when I have that low energy dip, what I'd like then is all of those subscriptions, promotions, or announcements, then they can come into my end basket and I can handle them all at once. Anyway, these are the kinds of things that I think of when I think about focus. Now, by the way, if I'm focused in on something that's moving me toward the goal, I actually feel a lift. I feel a, a raising energy there. And the two kinds of energy that we're going to talk about, specifically in the first part of the book, are mental energy and physical energy. So I'm going to ask you, what are the things that you can do at night, tonight, tomorrow morning, that will boost your energy? both mentally and physically for tomorrow. Tonight, that might mean only eating half your dessert, drinking an extra glass of water, or getting to bed a half an hour earlier. Tomorrow morning, it might mean getting up early and getting a workout in, having a complete breakfast, writing a letter to send to your, to, to put in your kid's lunchbox. Whatever that thing is, that if you do it now, it'll have benefits later on. It'll raise your energy. Uh, one of the fastest way I, ways I know of to boost energy is actually to take a look at your at my best when list. And we talk about this in the book, pages 26 and 27. But if you go to this website, you can get a lot more information about being at my best when. And the website right there, www.womackcompany.com slash AMBW is just for you. When it comes to the limited resource of time, there are 96 15-minute blocks. Always be ready for bonus time. You're going to get it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get somewhere and someone's going to be late. I'm going to arrive somewhere early. Something's going to happen that shifts the schedule. We're going to have a meeting that gets canceled at the last minute. But if you set yourself up for bonus time, then you can start to think about what you think about in new ways. Maybe pull out a piece of paper and a pen or go to a whiteboard or a flip chart and really dive into these two different kinds of thinking, these two different kinds of working. So just a real quick recap, there are noun thinkers, there are noun projects, there are noun approaches to work, and 
you can look at things from the point of view of verbs, actions and tasks and what you delegate and what you're waiting for. In fact, if you go to your to-do list right now, you may find that you've blended those two kinds of working, those two kinds of thinking. Question, could practicing something new build a new habit? Because if it could, what habits would you want to practice? So, of course, in Chapter 2, Part 1 of the book, we talk about the significance, the absolute importance of being, working, and living at what your 100% is. You know, I love this picture of the Winter Olympics. This is the speed skating short track. And if I look at that, there's four people who are completely focused. Everything they've got, task at hand, and what it is they're doing right now. And I love that concept. The question I ask is, in order for you to be, work, and live at your 100%, what will you need to have done, and how will you need to have been? Now, you're going to come up with your own list, and please do this activity for yourself. These are some of the things that I've come up with over the years that have really helped me be at my best. Not a guarantee, but boy, do they help me get a long way down that track. When I eat a balanced breakfast, when I capture my agreements and promises as I make them, when I say thank you to someone who may not accept it, uh, expect it, all of these things are the things that I know will make me better. They'll make me more engaged. They'll bring my focus in. You know, that last one where I say thank you to someone who may not expect it, that has been so much fun for me over the years to leave a thank you card with the server at a restaurant, to send a gratitude note to the author of a magazine or a book that I just read. I've called voicemails and just left a voicemail for someone saying thank you for that. And it's, it's fun and it's exciting. Hey, if you have any questions on this, if you want me to dive into any of these topics a little bit further, please do send me an email. My address is jason at womackcompany.com, and there are so many ideas that you're going to continue getting from the book, Your Best Just Got Better. I really look forward to hearing from you, to catching up with you anytime I can. Any questions or comments, doubts or considerations, please let me know. Have a great day, and consider passing this interview on.